other things is that they can often portray a message or a meaning in, in a very profound way. And uh, we, we are blessed here with a number of people who are willing to engage in that. So thank you uh, that we're a church that uses all kinds of gifts and what a blessing that is. Uh, we begin with a word of prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, even when you were on this earth, you used stories and you used items, including little children, to teach messages and to emphasize important points. So we are grateful for the creative arts in all of their forms. We pray that by your spirit, as we consider your word this day, that you, the true teacher, would continue to enable us to know why you came and to more fully live our lives in light of that glorious joy. We are grateful, Lord Jesus, for who you are and for all that you have done and for your presence with us today. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Given the season, I doubt that you would be surprised if I asked you if you could name all of Santa's reindeer. Uh, you might even break into song, who knows. Uh, but this morning, I'm not really interested in reindeer, but I'm going to take some of you back to your childhoods. Um, I'm interested in Christopher Robin and his friends. Okay, So who can name some of Christopher Robin's friends beyond the most famous teddy bear in the world, which would be uh, Winnie the Pooh? So what are some of, uh, some of uh, Christopher Robin's friends? Eeyore, Eeyore okay. Piglet. Rabbit. We got Winnie the Pooh, yeah. Owl. What about the gopher? Shy, right? I, I can't get the whistle between my front teeth today, but other. Uh, so we've got all kinds of them, and as I think about Winnie the Pooh's friends and their kind of more manifest characteristic. I think that Bob, a.k.a. Mark Werner, is definitely an Eeyore. <laughs> I mean, perhaps he's, he's tired. Maybe he's ground down by the demands and disappointments of daily life. But when it comes to life, his perspective is rather pessimistic. He is somewhat gloomy. And, and Roxy, she's definitely what? Tigger. Talk about enthusiasm and energy. Definitely a tigger. She is bouncy, 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 uh, but for all the right reasons. Because as she so wonderfully testified, she knows the promises of God and by faith holds on to them. That even though she doesn't have a job or money or family, or a place to live, even though she doesn't have the things that most of us take for granted, she possesses this joy. It's the joy of the Lord. <clears throat> Think about that phrase for a moment, the joy of the Lord. Uh, as we read our gospel lesson today, would you say that, that Mary possessed the joy of the Lord? And just like Roxy, it was the kind of joy she couldn't contain. She couldn't remain silent. She couldn't uh, remain from shouting and singing out aloud. As we sang in that song and as we heard read moments ago, she said, my soul rejoices in God. And she states the reason why she rejoices. There's that word for we read in verses, I think it's 52, it says, "For And here's the reason why her soul glorifies the Lord and her spirit rejoices in God her Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servants. Mary is so filled with joy because the Lord, the one who created the heavens and the earth, takes note of her. 
She is so filled with the joy of the Lord because the one who is king of kings and lord of lords is not offended by her lowly station in life. But wonders of wonders chooses her to do a most glorious thing, to be the bearer of his one and only son, Jesus. Now, even though Mary was used by the Lord in a unique way, her story is not unique, and that's what she acknowledges. That her story is what, but one of many stories of what the Lord does for those who trust in Him. That her story of mercy is repeated thousands and thousands of times. In every generation, the Lord does mighty things. He lifts up the humble, and he fills the hungry with good things. And he ever and always does it because the Lord remembers. Verses 54 and 55 of our text from Luke chapter 1. He, the Lord, has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Again and again, we, we read in the scriptures that God remembers. And when we encounter that phrase, God remembers, it's not as if God forgot. Like last night, we, 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 we went out to dinner, and I said earlier in the afternoon, I will call the restaurant and make reservations. <laughs> we are on the way to the restaurant, and I was like, oh, I was supposed to make reservations. That's how we often do it, is that we forget. And when we remember, it is because we have forgotten. But when the Lord remembers, it's not as if he has forgotten anything. But rather, when we encounter that phrase in the scripture, it means that God is about to act and he's going to do so in a rather marvelous way. Here are but two examples in which we read about God remembering. Both of them from the opening book of the Bible, Genesis. In Genesis chapter 8, but God remembered Noah. Do you think God forgot about Noah? It says, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. And then in Genesis chapter 30, it says... Then God remembered Rachel. So Rachel was one of Jacob's wives. What was Rachel's uh, heart's desire? What was her, her struggle in life? Do you remember? She was barren. She was barren. She wanted a child more than anything. And she had cried out to the Lord and she had prayed to the Lord and nothing happened. And in this 30th chapter, it says, Then God remembered Rachel. And now he takes action. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. Now I mention all of that because what we see in today's text from Isaiah chapter 35 is a partial remembering. That as we look at today's text in light of our gospel reading, we see that God has in part made good on his promise. And that specific promise is stated in verse 4. In which it says, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance. He will come with divine retribution. He will come to save you. That promise, as you know, was fulfilled in Jesus. In the one born of Mary. And think about the joy that attended Jesus' birth. You have the shepherds minding their business, doing what shepherds do at night, and the angel comes to them and says, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of what? Of great joy that will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born, who is Christ the Lord. How many times do you think you've heard the, the Christmas story? How, what's that? Thousands. Thousands of times, okay. 
I may be in the hundreds. I don't know if I'm in the thousands of times yet. I mean, we, we know it. Uh, we, we can picture Linus as he stands there in, you know, the, the great uh, Peanuts um, version of it when he reads the Lukean account. And so we've heard it so many times before. And because we've heard it so many times before, it's easy for us to overlook the profound significance of Jesus' birth. That at the very moment Jesus was born, the parched land and the desert, all of creation at that moment began to shout aloud and rejoice greatly. And that joy only increased as Jesus grew in wisdom and stature before men and God. That joy only increased as the promised eyes of the blind were open and those who were lame could leap like deer. Two accounts from Luke, both dealing with the promised restorations that we read about in Isaiah 35. And notice the joy that attends them. In the 18th chapter, we read about the blind man. He's sitting along the side of the road. He knows that Jesus is coming, and he begins to shout out to Jesus, and people tell him what? What do they tell him? Shut up. Sorry, parents, if your kids are here. I know that's a word you're not supposed to use. Uh, They tell him to be quiet. Don't bother the man. He's got better things to do, and he refuses to be silent. And Jesus invites him to come near him. And as he comes near, Jesus asks him a question. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. And in Luke 5, we read about friends that are true friends. They have a a friend who's paralyzed, and so they bring that paralyzed man to Jesus. They tear through the roof, and they lower him down right in front of Jesus. And Jesus says to him, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took his mat, and went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Remarkable indeed. That that was evidence that God had come to his people. It was a rather profound and miraculous sign that the Lord was in that moment beginning to undo the curse of of sin, but he came not only to address the ills of sin, but sin itself. But in order to do that, the story takes a less than joyful turn. So think about it for a moment. We're skipping ahead in the story. We're moving from, from Jesus' birth. Now he's in Jerusalem. Now he's been, uh, he's led out of Jerusalem. And a host of women follow him. And they shout and they wail. And even creation reacts to Jesus' suffering and death. It says that the sky turned black. But hear this well, that, that, that morning uh, was uh, short-lived. Because three days later, as we read in, in Mark's gospel, that the women who had gone to the tomb, they, they hurried away from the tomb. It says that they were afraid but filled with What's the word? They were filled with joy. And picture two, 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus has done all of the teaching and has provided many convincing signs. He takes his disciples into the vicinity of Bethany and he raises his hands to bless them. And as he's blessing them, he leaves them. He he is uh, ascended into heaven. And rather than being distraught, St. Luke tells us that this is how the disciples responded. They worshiped Jesus and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. 
It was the kind of joy that Mary and countless others had experienced. It was the joy in the Lord. It was the joy of the Lord. Two more things and then we're done. That if you look at today's text from Isaiah chapter 35, we see that our joy is twofold. That the first part of our joy is that that the Lord has come for us. That in so doing, he has saved us through his son Jesus. And the second part of the joy is is that the one who has come for us has made it possible for for us to come to him. Do you get that? Do you understand that? That the one who has come for us has now made it possible for us to come to him. That's what the imagery in verses 8, 9, and 10 depict. It depicts those who are on the way. Listen to these verses. That those who are on the way of, that Jesus has made, it says, they will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy. What kind of joy? Oh, in this life we have temporary joy, but an everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. In recent weeks, we've talked about the advent of peace and hope, both of which have come because Christ came. And yet we acknowledge and we see every day that that peace and that hope are not yet fully realized. And not surprisingly, the same thing is true with the joy that is ours. We have joy, amen, but that joy isn't yet full. That for now there are still seasons for us in which we sorrow. For now there are yet times when we sigh deeply because of the demands and the disappointments of life. And yet we ought not, we cannot allow those things to rob us of the joy that is ours. Because Jesus has come. Listen to these joyous affirmations in 1 Peter. And, and, and notice what he says about the sorrow and the sign. Is that so often in life we want no sorrow. And so often in life we don't want to sigh over everything. We want to just click our ruby slippers together and we want to have a perfect life. But God uses the seasons of sorrow. He uses the deep things that, that cause us to sigh deeply in life to fashion us and ready us for the joys that are yet to come. Do you believe that? Listen to these joyous affirmations. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice he talks about life in the middle. That God shields us, that God protects that which he has in store for us. He says, in all this you greatly rejoice, though for now... You have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Do you you get that? In all this you greatly rejoice, though now you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Why? Why? Because these have come that our faith might be proven genuine. And then he goes on to say, Though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. So as we gather for worship on this third Sunday in Advent, we shout aloud despite our seasons of sorrow. 
and that we sing with joy even though there are moments in our lives when we sigh deeply because life isn't what it ought to be. And the reason why we shout aloud, the reason why we sing is not because we're delusional. Truly, we sing and shout aloud because there is an advent of hope. You know that uh, familiar Christmas carol, right? Joy to the world. Joy to the world. Why? Because the Lord is come. And thanks be to God, the one who has come is coming again. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you know that often we're like Bob, that we allow the things of this life to rob us of our joy. If not rob us, to to overshadow the joy that is ours. Help us to remember that you are a God who remembers. That you are faithful to all your words of promise. And most clearly and most profoundly seen in the coming of Jesus, your son. We are grateful that he experienced a season of sorrow that we might know a joy even this side of heaven and pray that that joy would permeate our hearts and minds and would enable us to sing and shout aloud even in the midst of seasons of sorrow and deep sighing. For we know that the things that we experience in this life, those hardships and heartaches are actually being used by you that we might be ready for the joy that is ours, that joy that awaits us when you come again in glory. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to work genuine faith in our hearts, that even now we would experience the joy of the Lord, and that you would safeguard our hearts and minds that one day we might experience that joy in its fullness in your glorious presence. We pray all these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.